Gary Kaspar why he made a certain move, he'll say, well, it was just the right move, or it feels right. What Gary Kasparov knows is the weight of history, the burden of defending a tradition traceable at least to the 6th century, to India or Persia. When the Caliph of Baghdad was asked, what is chess? He answered, what is life? For the faithful, the 64 squares hold incomparable beauty and impenetrable mystery. A game whose possibilities haven't been exhausted yet. A puzzle that may never be solved, not entirely. The origins of chess are linked to games of war, to intricate maneuvers, a game of cunning and courage, played by warriors of the mind. This fight between these two egos, two, uh, two intellects, it's the essence of chess, you know. It's a essential point of, 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 of our struggle. And that's why I think that chess is a very violent sport, because uh, having the match, let's say Kasparov Karpov, uh, you are trying to destroy the ego of your opponent, and it's two very strong wills. And if you win, it's a big psychological shock for, the, for, 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 for in, in a, another player. In order to want to compete at chess, in order to want to win at chess, it probably takes a certain type of personality. Um, you need to be very competitive. Um, you need to have a very large ego, really a strong desire. To, to beat someone in some sense. A lot of ego, a lot of resolve, a lot of determination, a lot of arrogance. Then we get down to talent. That's the last part. And if you ain't got the talent, you ain't gonna make it. And you gotta wanna win. I have to destroy it. I have to, that I'm human. I have to uh, remember that this is the, I have a special strategy how to, 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 to show the computer's consequences and how to avoid the unpleasant positions for me. And the, mm, it gives me more confidence yes, playing, playing against computer than if I play versus uh, a strong, strong player. But the idea of, of the game is still the same, to destroy your opponent ego, your opponent uh, uh, mentality. Even if it's a computer mentality, it doesn't matter. To outwit a computer's mentality, Kasparov has prepared for deep thought as he would any other opponent by carefully studying 50 of its previous games. Playing the white pieces, deep thought moved first. Kasparov chose a Sicilian defense named for an Italian priest who first recorded the move in the year 1617. After 10 moves and an exchange of minor pieces, the game is fairly even. It's about ready to play. Ooh, it's coming up, and that gives it a score. It thinks it's got almost half a pawn advantage at this point. It thinks white has a very strong position in this, in this uh, particular configuration. White has a very strong dominating position in the center, and it, Deep Thought likes that sort of position. The game's mathematical limit is vast. For the machine, speed is essential. The faster the computer, the more positions it can examine. It's looking at close to 700,000 chess positions every second as it's calculating this. And by the time we're done, in, in maybe a minute, that's you know, 5 million, uh, or sorry, 50 million chess positions. Chess may be both art and science, but in the computer chess game, it's also engineering. Carnegie Mellon University, birthplace of deep thought, is a pioneer in the quest to build a chess machine better than any human. So deep thought starts when it's making a move by setting out a little chess board. So there it is, okay? And the game of chess is played by, by making moves from this. So this is the way the actual game of chess is played, is by making moves from this, which move to a new chessboard, at which point, let's, let's use another color, at which point the, um, the opponent, so we'll put human in red and, and this in blue, okay? The human opponent makes a move, and then, and that's the way the actual game would go. Deep Thought makes a move, human makes a move, Deep Thought makes a move, okay? 
if you're sitting here trying to make a move, then the question is, is that the right way to go? There are other things that you can do, okay? So, in fact, you might look at this or this or this. At the chessboard, it's not a matter of luck. There's no roll of the dice. To begin the game, there are 20 possible moves. After one move by each side, the number of possible board positions increases to 400. After three moves, to more than 20,000. By mid-game, to look ahead several moves involves possibilities in the trillions. To find the best move, Deep Thought must look at every possibility that time allows, at a game tree whose branches extend in every direction the game can take. There's no way in which any computer present or perspective could play out all the branches of the game tree. Uh, you can get various numbers to uh, estimate how big that is. Uh, I used to say 10 to the 120th, but that's probably too big. It's probably only like 10 to the 50th. Well, that's a number that's order of magnitude the number of molecules in the universe. And so the problem sitting here, if, uh, I don't know, that's, that's the human, I guess. I don't know what deep thought. Deep thought looks like this. It's got squares or something like that, okay? So if this is deep thought, not the human here, it's got to consider all the different ways the game might go. Some place out here, so let's take it here. Some place out here, a good thing happens. Deep thought, from, from deep thought's point of view. Deep thought, in fact, takes a rook. It takes something, takes a piece of material off the board. And that's the case, then that's a big plus for it. But if that's the case, then the human is certainly going to see that, right? So the human certainly isn't going to go do that move. Human's going to go and take this move, for which, in fact, we may go way out here some more before good or bad things happen. The computer determines which moves are good or bad by its evaluation function, which assigns a numerical value to each piece on every square of the chessboard. Well, deep thought is partly number crunching, but partly more generally symbol crunching, because it's looking at actual chess positions stored in the computer. But the, the symbols there don't represent the numbers from 1 to 10. The symbols there represent queens and pawns and rooks and so on in a certain geometrical relation. We know how to program a computer memory, so it'll keep that, that geometric information around. Sort of like a, well, like your mind's eye, like a mental image. And what it does is to say, well, if I made this move and the board was changed in this way, what would it look like then? The number crunching is all at the end of this process when it finds a position and wants to evaluate it. Then it says, oh, I've got, uh, you know, two rooks and a bishop and a knight that's worth uh, uh, 16 points and so on, and I've got this uh, center control and so forth, and that's worth so much, so it kind of adds it up. So here you are, sitting back here at the beginning, where none of these moves have been made, okay? And your problem is to go out and search, which is why we always talk, search out, and when you find things, to realize what the opponent would do and therefore what you ought to do, in order to find out that, in the long run, this one didn't work and that one doesn't work, but this is, in fact, the, the best one that you can see in terms of how far out you can look, okay? And so that's what's called the search of, this is called the game tree, doesn't look much like a tree, but if you, if you turned it this way and drew it up like this, then it would look like a bush growing up. It's called the game tree, and this is called the search of the game tree, deciding whether there's a plus or you lose a rook out there, or the position is simply bad for you, you're all cramped in one corner. That's called the evaluation function, and that's how these things play chess. Well, I can start the program, and what it does is it searches down to a depth of four. That means it looks ahead two moves for white and two moves for black and comes up with a value. In this case, it thinks the value is four. That means it's slightly better for white and it wants to play the move e4. Then it comes back and does the whole thing again except doing it one, one move deeper. So it searches ahead three moves for white, two moves for black. So that's five what we call ply. And in that case, it changes its move, and it plays a different move, knight to c3. And then we continue this process. It's called iterative deepening. You go deeper, one, step by step. Now it's going six, seven, eight, and then it'll reach this maximum depth that it's set. We can call that her the horizon. And then at that point, it's going to evaluate the position. The whole search through all these possibilities, the goal is to find the line of play that leads to the best position. 
a position with the highest value for the player that's on the move. The prototype for Deep Thought sits on the floor of an engineering lab. It was built for a few thousand dollars from scraps by a graduate student who didn't play chess. This is Deep Thought. Mm -hmm. What are we looking at? Um, you're looking at what's normally called printed circuit board. And there are two processes on this. Each process can process about 500,000 chess position per second. And combined together, depending on the software, it can examine between 700 to 800,000 position per second. And the core to both processors is a so-called chess mood generator. Here's the blows up micro photographs of the chips. And you can it had nice eight by eight patterns. And this is essentially a ch silicon chess ball. Here's what it physically look like of the chips. On this one, each one is a chips. And each one of them is a chess moon generator. A silicon chess board packed neatly into two microprocessors generating close to a million positions a second. That's the hardware which allows Deep Thought to search out all possibilities up to five moves ahead, and which in the eyes of a human champion can produce unexpected results. Deep Thought has failed to perform a special maneuver to protect its king, called castling. Either Deep Thought has found something Kasparov doesn't see, or it has made a mistake. Either way, the computer is carried forward by the power of its massive search, playing this subtle and cerebral game by what's called brute force. The core of Deep Thought is its, its brute force search, and that's how it generates all its ideas, quote, ideas, its moves. And so without that, Deep Thought would not play very well at all without a brute force, a very large brute force search. Brute force. The red light indicates the depth of the search. A special program called Singular Extension helps Deep Thought identify and look deeper into especially promising moves, something it must do to be competitive. To demonstrate Singular Extension, Deep Thought comes up with a memorable move from a 1938 game between world champions, the Russian Botvinnik and the Cuban Capablanca. It took Botvinnik examining this one position 30 minutes to find the winning move. Deep Thought finds it in 10. Singular Extension gets more out of a computer search, enabling Deep Thought to see as many as 20 moves ahead in complicated positions. A human looks at one or two positions in a second, maybe a hundred positions when it's considering a move. Deep Thought looks at several million a second. And when you take this over an average three minutes moves, you're talking a hundred million positions, something like that. Very, very little knowledge, lots of engineering. For Deep Thought, a little knowledge goes a long way, but not without a code of commands that weighs almost five pounds. In tournament play, there are time limits. For Deep Thought, that means a trade-off between time spent on search and time spent on knowledge, including its evaluation function. The Deep Thought team believes more speed alone, a deeper search will be enough to win, but they're taking no chances. You need some minimum amount of knowledge and of course, the more knowledge you have, the less speed you need. But the way we look at it is that if we can add a little bit of extra knowledge, that gives us an extra margin of safety in achieving our goal to beat Kasparov. More has been written about chess than for all other games combined. What Kasparov brings to the chessboard includes a thousand years of recorded history and wisdom, of which Deep Thought knows very little. The computer game is speed and search, not knowledge. But it needs to know some things that only a grand master can teach it. One thing that Deep Thought is lacking is hundreds of years of chess experience. And that kind of experience is necessary for Deep Thought to perform on you know, the top level. And... Uh, Can you provide a computer with that kind of experience? Yes, and th this, is, uh, this is particularly what I'm doing, uh, trying to provide Deep Thought with that kind of experience. 
Deep thought doesn't think for itself or learn from its mistakes. To fine tune its performance, the computer is given classic chess problems. If it fails to solve them, its program is re examined with the help of one of America's best players, Max Delugi. Have you played Deep Thought? Oh, yes, many times. What was the outcome? How have you done? Uh, I don't know. I guess Murray takes, uh, <laughs> keeps the medallion. <laughs> Max tries provocative things to try and discover more weakness in the program, so he doesn't necessarily always play what he thinks is the best move. He will play a less good move in order to, to test out some idea. There are certain limitations uh, for Deep Thought now, and uh, it's, it's going to be a question of whether brute force will, you know, uh, uh,